Hello, all you wonderful fools. It's time for the Mr. T Show. All aboard! Here we go, let's start the show. Hosted by Mr. T. Nintendo video games are the favorite ones for me. News and review some gameplay too. Battling drones is what I do. M-I-Z. C-A-H is the show of Ms. A T. It's the show of Ms. A T. Ooh. Hey, foos. Big T here, and I'm back with another video. Uh, this video will be a follow-up to my last video. Um, well, the last video I did talking about Super Mario Odyssey and uh, its influences, possible influences from Banjo-Kazooie in that series. There were some people who were dissenting, <laughs> I should say. Um, not not um, not so much in the comments, but in the uh, the dislike bar, <laughs> um, which you know, I think if you have a differing opinion of something, you should at least like leave a comment. A lot of people did, and we had good discussions back and forth, and I appreciate that. Um, but uh, you know, some people just. I think a lot of people just hit the dislike button because they I was talking about Nintendo maybe taking from somebody else or maybe coming up using other people's ideas to make something which is you know it's strange to me because no matter how great you are uh, no idea is original and um, some of my favorite movies and some of my favorite directors of all time have been inspired by other movies and other directors that's just how it works that's how it works in the the world of art um the world of media so i think people took offense to me saying that miyamoto could possibly have uh borrowed some ideas um which miyamoto talks all the time <laughs> about borrowing ideas or coming up with an idea from this or that i mean you you don't think um, and I already know the answer to this. I already know he did it, it did inspire it, but you don't think that the Legend of Zelda was inspired by Peter Pan um, because it was. It <laughs> uh, also things like Lord of the Rings. Um, yeah, the Legend of Zelda was definitely inspired by those things, and I don't know why people see that as a or me saying that as a bad thing. I just think that's strange. Um, one of my, one of the best Kung Fu or not Kung Fu, but one of the best martial arts films of all time, um, uh, Enter the Dragon, uh, has this scene at the end, uh, with, uh, Bruce Lee going through this, uh, kind of mirror room and he's taking on the bad guy or whatever. And I just thought that was an amazing scene. Um, but that is borrowed. <laughs> um, I was in film school and we were. You know, looking at the great films of throughout history. And then we came upon um, Lady from Shanghai. And lo and behold, that third act, there's a mirror scene, mirror house scene that was uh, very familiar to me. And I was like, oh, so that is where it came from. That's pretty cool. Um, I didn't get bent out of shape and say, you know, oh, no, no. Uh, uh, Enter the Dragon did it first, or it doesn't matter. No, they didn't. They didn't get the idea from that. You know, I didn't, I just thought that was a cool thing. This is something that happens repeatedly in history. Um, uh, look, Star Wars. Star Wars is not uh, wholly original. Um, obviously, the characters and all that stuff is, but uh, George Lucas, as many times, has said and, that he's pulled from the '30s, 1930s serials. Um, and if you go look at them, you'll see that whole title scroll thing, title crawl thing that happens at the beginning of every Star Wars movie that is pulled right from 30 serials. <laughs> um, and, uh, he was a huge fan of Akira Kurosawa, uh, with seven, seven samurai was a huge influence on him. And you can see that in, uh, Star Wars, Darth Vader himself was basically, um, you know, a samurai um, with the big helmet and all that. All that was influenced by George Lucas's influences. So I don't know. I just think it's strange, like I said, that people would get upset 
Um, and but this is the whole thing. Like I'm I'm not completely blind <laughs> to the fact that rare. And this is the uh, topic of the video we're going to get into here. Um, rare is pretty mediocre <laughs> without Nintendo pretty much before and after Nintendo rare has been pretty mediocre um, as a developer and you know that's just that's just a fact and they benefited very much so from Nintendo's influence and I understand that <laughs> like uh, that that is not something that I don't understand I get that I wholly get that but that doesn't mean like you can't that Nintendo couldn't come up with stuff from rare even though rare used them to come up with stuff this is what happens people pull ideas from each other when they especially when they work closely um, so if you look at rare before Nintendo and I'm not I meant before like a close partnership because rare was on NES and they did tons of games uh, a lot of licensed stuff mostly um, most of the stuff that stood out from rare was like RC Pro-Am uh, Battletoads obviously but like you know even Battletoads which is kind of a revered game it wasn't that great of a game like what was great about it is that it looked very different from most NES titles uh, because Rare knew how to push the hardware and so Battletoads looked very different like you wouldn't think NES uh, could put out that those kind of visuals those kind of animations um, especially you know with the punching and all that stuff that you saw in uh, <laughs> Battletoads how the fist got bigger and looked like a cartoon almost that was uh, pretty shall, shall I say rare to see on Nintendo uh, on the NES um, you didn't think they could do that and they were just really good at pushing hardware that was their biggest thing rare was always really good at tapping hardware and coming up with cool new you know software uh, twerks and whatnot so um, when they partnered with Nintendo Nintendo was impressed by their technical skills uh, and so when they partnered with Nintendo they started to learn from Nintendo about how to develop games and uh, we saw that uh, first and foremost with Donkey Kong Country. Um, Donkey Kong Country had the benefit of, uh, or not Donkey Kong Country itself, but developers had the benefit of looking at Mario games and what worked and what didn't work. And they had the benefit of the close relationship with Nintendo. And uh, I believe Miyamoto oversaw plenty, a lot of aspects of that game, um, but he didn't, you know they still developed a lot of stuff in that game themselves and uh, you know came up with a lot of their own ideas you know um, this, you know a lot of times the director or the supervisor or whatever would go get credit um, but you know they're just overseers they just make sure everything's running smoothly and they like the ideas and making sure that stuff works for what Nintendo wants so um, but obviously the golden era of Rare was uh, late uh, Super Nintendo uh, through the N64 when they came out with those great platformers, uh, Banjo-Kazooie, um, uh, Donkey Kong 64, uh, and you know great shooters like GoldenEye 007, Perfect Dark, um, uh, Jet Force Gemini. They um, they were in the golden era because they were able to uh, work closely with the Nintendo, see how Nintendo developed games, got feedback from Nintendo, and that's why their games were so great at that time. Like I said, before Nintendo, before the partnership, they were making plenty of games, but nothing was like, wow, this is you know, stood out. Um, they caught Nintendo's eye because of their technical prowess. Uh, not so much their game design um, and uh, when I was talking about Banjo-Kazooie and whatnot uh, Banjo-Kazooie would not have been nearly as good of a platformer without the blueprint that was Super Mario 64 
I understand that. <laughs> I get that. I'm not oblivious to that. I get that. Um, but even with that, uh, uh, Rare was able to come up with their own ideas. And I think, like I said, um, the Mumbo uh, uh, capture, not capture mechanic, but the Mumbo transformation mechanic um, seemed pretty original to them. And when I was talking about Super Mario, or when I was talking about uh, Mario games, and somebody brought up like Kirby, and I'm like, I understand Kirby. <laughs> That's Kirby's thing. He sucks your abilities. And but what what I'm even with that, you can go through a Kirby game without sucking anybody's abilities. Um, that helps you, but you don't really need to do it. My point was that uh, when you uh, when Banjo used that mechanic to transform the other things he needed to do that to acquire certain jiggies and uh and the mario odyssey is the same way you need to capture uh certain uh enemies or certain uh creatures in the game or whatever to acquire specific moons you can't get them without doing that that's the point i was making not that a capture ability or transformation ability was yeah, something new that rare came up with i just i was talking about that gameplay mechanic where it was necessary that was uh for as far as i can see is a rare thing um from my experience so um but like i said now you look at the n64 era great era for rare but post n64 <laughs> was not is not good for a rare um their most notable title probably after the Microsoft acquisition is Viva Pinata. That is their most solid game since then. And, you know, it's kind of a, uh, it's a different kind of game. It's a kind of a niche, um, uh, I guess, strategy uh, sim kind of game with pinatas <laughs> with the weird kind of it's a niche game but it's very solid it's a very fun solid game um but you know that is nowhere near the greatness that they uh had you know mid 90s into 2000 so how good is rare that's that's i guess that's the question i'm asking like how good is rare um, and obviously they lost the Stamper Brothers. The Stamper Brothers were the guys who pretty much, you know, they were the ones who started it, started Rare. And uh, back when they were, what were they? Something, the game? Let me look it up here. I don't, uh, don't want to say Ultimate, but that doesn't sound right. They were, uh, yeah, Ultimate Play the Game. That's what they started off as. Oh, I guess I remember that right. I'm looking at Wikipedia here. Yeah, so they started off with Ultimate Play the Game. They had the Stamper Brothers. But um, even before the Stamper Brothers left, a lot of guys left Rare to um, form Free Radical Design. Uh, I want to say, what, around 99, 2000? A lot of those GoldenEye, Perfect Dark uh, developers, a lot of the guys from those teams, uh, created Free Radical Design who made, um, oh, what was the game? Time Splitters. They made the Time Splitters series, and uh, semi-successful. But um, and you and if you play Time Splitters, you know that that's like GoldenEye. That's just it, it feels and looks a lot like GoldenEye um, in the Perfect Dark. So, um, but yeah, like I said, um, even with the Stamper Brothers beforehand, uh, their games were good and technical. Um, you know, they did, like I said, they did a lot of licensed stuff. You know, they had, you know, stuff that kind of stood out a little bit, like Saber Wolf and, um, what was that? Uh, it was a shooter game. I can't remember. Let me see if I can find it on Wikipedia here. Um, uh, oh, Slalom was, you know, somewhat well known. Slalom, uh, what was the. Yeah, I can't seem to find it here. I don't want to be lingering on too much here. But, I mean, they, you know, obviously, when they got the Microsoft, Mar they had, like, you know, Cameo and um, uh, Perfect Dark Zero, which is awful. Uh, Cameo was okay, 
But even like Cameo, that was in development for GameCube. I remember seeing uh, screens for it, and obviously it got moved on to Xbox 360 and what, grabbed by the ghoulies. <laughs> I mean, not a good game. Um, and they went on, Microsoft had them doing Connect, and Connect Sports stuff and build, making avatars and, you know, and I think, I don't think they did anything with the new Killer Instinct game. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong with that. And they, um, now they have Sea of Thieves that they're working on, um, which some people seem to like, but, you know, it doesn't seem to really appeal to me. I have to get more, you know, you know, time with that and see where that game's going, but, um, still nowhere near their peaks. So, like I said, I, Rare, um, without Nintendo has been okay to mediocre as a company. Um, I don't think that's controversial to say. Um, but like even with that, I still feel like uh, they did bring some stuff that was new that Nintendo said, hey, that's a cool mechanic, let's use that. And I don't see anything controversial about that either, but like I said, uh, some people didn't like that for whatever reasons. But anyway, uh, let me know what you think in the comments below as always. Um, I will be following this video up with a versus of Super Mario 64 versus Banjo-Kazooie um, for my versus series. It'll be the second video in that series. Hope you guys check that out. Uh, let me know what you think as always. Thank you for watching and listening, and I'll see you fools next time. Peace out. Oh yeah, one more thing. Play Nintendo fools. Dude.